Howdy folks, John here. As you can see, we're doing a Roban update video to the EC130, H130. And uh, I've just been putzing away at this uh, model now for the past couple of evenings. Kind of trial fitting the mechanics for the first time just to make sure there's no huge train wrecks along the way. And everything is lining up good. We'll look at that a little bit uh, later on. There was really no surprises except one. Uh, the Fenestron, however, is fitting and well aligned in the duct. That was my biggest concern, but no problems there at all. Uh, this video is primarily going to be about electronics pairings. I've been getting quite a few questions on that, so I thought I'd show you what electronics I'm going to be putting into this thing. And then at the end of the video, we'll uh, crack open the Fenestron to see how it works. Let's get over to the workbench. Oh, I just love getting electronics for a fresh heli build. Before getting to them, I just wanted to mention a couple of things I missed in the unboxing uh, that were kind of cool. The heli came with this nice scale antenna set, and it also came with little uh, light lenses, so you don't just see a bare LED sticking out. It's got these little uh, scale lenses for it. I also mentioned in that unboxing video that it only came with the German manual. I have since located the PDF for the English one and printed it out. So yeah, definitely useful. I have a link to this manual now in the unboxing video, um, but I'll also fire a link below in the description. Speaking of links, I will have links to all the electronics here and where I got them from. Um, my main reason for getting these specific ones is familiarity and value. I think this represents some of the best bang for the buck, but in no way is this an exhaustive list. This is just what I like, but it should give you some ideas. May as well start with the power system. As many know, on large helicopters, I don't run a Beck. I want a dedicated electronics battery, and I'm going to be running an unregulated 2S uh, LiPo pack, running HV servos. Everything here is safe to run at 8.4 volts. That's my RX power for my main flight batteries. No surprise here. You know I'm a Gen's Ace fanboy. I'm going to be running their 6S 5100 milliamp hour packs. Two in series, so this is a 12S system, 50 volts roughly, and uh, yeah, just such a usable battery size, these 5000 or 5100 6S packs. I use them in basically all my large helicopters, and R2-D2 for anyone who's watched the R2 series. For the ESC and the motor... I got these from Sam at HeliDirect. I want to thank him right now. He gave me a little bit of a discount. So thanks, Sam. And I chose the Phoenix Edge HV120 just because I'm using this in a lot of my larger uh, helicopters and never had a problem with them. And what I love about the Phoenix Edge ESCs is their data logging feature. After a flight, you can download basically any metric you want. It measures voltage, current, temperature, power, ripple voltage, head speed, um, I know I'm missing a few, but uh, on a fresh scale build, it's really nice to monitor that. And it, it can also help diagnose problems down the road. And I chose the 120 uh, just because there's no way this thing's ever going to draw much over 100 amps. So 120 should be plenty. I think it will peak upwards for short durations. I think it's safe up to 150 or 160. But uh, yeah, I think 120 should be enough. Certainly I've never on my other Roban. You know, it sips 50, 60 amps during most of the flight. And I'm so happy I got this from HeliDirect because Sam actually mentioned this motor. I didn't even know Ego Drift made a scale series, but they do. And they've got one specifically for the Roban HSM 800 mechanics. Ego Drift make wonderful motors, high quality, Japanese bearing, hand wound. And yeah, it says right on here, where is it? Scale. So, you know, you, there's 3D motors and everything, but these ones are specifically for scale. So they're 4035 HS, 460 KV. It's got the long shaft with the flat all the way along, which is needed for the HSM mechanics. But just fantastic motors. So thanks, Sam, for <laughs> letting me know you even have those. I didn't know you could get uh, an Ego Drift specifically for scale. Great motors. Fly barless system, no surprise here. <laughs> Bavarian Demon 3X. Meat and potatoes, fly barless system. No self-level stuff, just a solid, no-nonsense fly barless system. 
proven. I fly all my large helicopters with this unit. I love the feel of it. And one thing nice for scale is it's got a great pitch filtering algorithm. Uh, you don't have to go that deep. You don't have to mess around in the PIDs or the acceleration rates or anything for the pitch axis. And on big, heavy scale helis, this is going to be the heaviest tail heli that I've ever flown. Um, it's easy to get tail oscillations along the pitch axis, you know, porpoising. That filtering algorithm is perfect for eliminating that. At least I found that on my other large helis along the pitch axis. And like most fly barless systems, multiple connectivity options, S-Bus, uh, DSM, satellite receivers up to two, or just standard uh, connectivity to a standard receiver through the included cable loom. Comes with the USB cable for programming it with the fly barless wizard. Super easy to set up. So that's why I like 3X. It's never let me down. And I'm gonna be running a FR Sky X8R receiver. Really been happy with these since switching to FR Sky. Good value, telemetry, and I will be using all eight channels. Five for my primary flight controls. There'll be a gain channel, uh, light channel for the lights, and also eventually a channel for a moving pilot's head. So I will be using all eight. And last up are the servos. And I got these from Dale at Buddy RC. Anyone who's um, been on my website and read my RC servo page, you know I'm a pretty big fan of KST servos. I think they currently represent the best servo value on the market right now. And Buddy RC has a, one of the best selections I've found. Now for the three cyclic servos, I'm going to be running their BLS 815. This is the version 2. I've only had the original one, so this is going to be a new servo for me. I've never tried the version 2 before, but hopefully it's just as good, if not better. And I recommend this for any 600, 700, or 800 size heli. Just looking at the specs here, uh, 7.4 volts, let's look at that. 17 kilograms per centimeter and 0 0.08 seconds per 60, well within the range that Roban recommends for their cyclic. In fact, it's almost double the torque, so no problem there. And you know, they're just great value. Servos are around $60. And for a brushless high voltage digital, that's amazing value. And they're just really nice looking servos. You know, high quality standard servo, fully sealed, screws are sealed, the output shaft is sealed. If you've ever taken one apart to look at the circuit board, just fantastic soldering quality. Nice little servos for the price. As you can see, you're not paying for any fancy packaging, just a little flimsy cardboard box, the servo, and of course, servo horns, mounting grommets. And like I said, that's for the cyclic. For the tail, we're using something completely different that I've never used before. This is the X23612 and high torque servo. Now with a big scale heli, you don't need super fast tail servos, you know, nothing like sub 0 0.05 seconds per 60. This one is rated at 0.12 seconds per 60. You could certainly use a standard cyclic servo on most large scale helicopters. However, with the Fenestron, we need high torque as well. The manual recommends at least 15 kilograms per centimeter. I'm doubling that overkill, but the servo is under a lot of strain. Holding those nine blades pitched over, for anti-torque. So uh, yeah, hopefully this is going to be fine. Again, brushless full metal gear set. Looks identical to the uh, 815 V2. I think to uh, show the mechanic fitment adequately, we'll have to do this freehand, so I apologize ahead of time for any shakies. As I had mentioned in the first video, the mechanics on these row bands are really easy to fit. Uh, they've already got everything pretty much set up. You just slide them back on the uh, plate. It's just a plywood plate in there or bottom shelf, whatever you want to call that. And everything lined up really well. The mechanics on the frames, they've got these little aluminum angle brackets. There's four of them, one on each corner. The back ones just slide under plates. I don't know if you can see that back there. Pretty dark. Let me zoom in. 
Yeah, it's not focusing. Anyway, they just slide under plates, so there's nothing to mount at the back. You just slide the mechanics back. And on the front, they just mount with two M3 hex bolts. The holes in these are elongated, so you can position the mechanics left and right, so you can get really nice alignment for your swash plate and your mast centered in the hole, even spacing for your swash ears on the little cutouts. The only thing I did have to do is get my rotary tool. You wouldn't have to do this, but I just found it a little bit easier. When you're sliding it in and out, the bell cranks hang up on the side here. So I just ground the fiberglass down a little bit with these little openings here so the uh, bell crank could pass by. You can see I've just got my level on there making sure everything is sitting nice and level. So no problem at all fitting the mechanics. One little uh, interesting tidbit is on my AS350, the batteries slide into these openings. But there's, you know, there's little plates that slide back here. These are notched out for the plates. Nothing on this one. And in fact, they don't even slide back as far as I want because the bulkhead back there, the hole is too small. These don't stick out too far though that the uh, nose section won't fit on. So I could have them in that position. I'll just have to come up with a plate. But of course, this thing's such a wide mother, you could fit the batteries up here as well. So I'm going to have to figure out what I'm going to do. I would kind of like to have them lower though, to lower the center of mass. But uh, let's look at the tail boom because that was the one little alignment issue. So the tail boom section is screwed on to the front fuselage section with six little hex screws and you just epoxy these little plywood plates that have got threaded inserts. But you kind of have to align everything to make sure, you know, the tail boom is level. Now, if you just let this sit naturally, you know, allow the profiles to match, kind of have the paint line match, there's a pretty big problem. Let's go to the back of the tail and look. So as you can see, with the tail boom just naturally sitting and the paint lines lined up, we've got a significant left lean or left cant to the tail section so that's no good of course you can you know there is wiggle room in here to twist it so we can twist it so it is level about there i would suspect but then of course the paint lines don't line up not major but it's a bummer and also the profiles between the two don't quite match this is bulged a little bit and same on the other side you know it's meant to be sitting like that and when we twist it, we get a little bit of a bulge here. Now, of course, once we drill our holes, we can squash that down a bit. And by heating it up with a heat gun, not too much, but just enough to soften the fiberglass and the fiberglass resin, you can certainly reprofile it. So I'm not overly concerned, but uh, yeah, I had to point it out, right? Because it's not ideal. As I was saying, the nice surprise is how well the Fenestron fits in the duct here. There was really no fitment issues at all. The way this works is pretty cool. There's a um, clamp that clamps on the inside of the boom with a profiled plate that matches the profile of the duct. And then there's another plate on the outside here that screws to that one. So these two plates are sandwiching the fiberglass boom duct to the boom. So there's no movement at all. The holes are already pre-drilled. And like I said, the alignment is pretty much perfect. There's really no adjustment top and bottom. Side to side, you can move the tail drive block in and out. It's a clamp block. There's a little screw locating hole as well. And I had to move it back a little bit this way. Otherwise, the blade was too close to the front edge of the duct. But I've got it perfectly centered now. And I'm just going to drill a new hole on this side for that locating screw. What's neat, these blades, they're actually curved as well. So the curvature of the blade actually matches the curvature of the duct. So that was my biggest worry, was how well this was gonna fit, if it was gonna move around, not at all. Really solid. But let's get this off and take a look inside of this thing. In like sin. Wow. So yeah. 
Let's have a look here. I'm just going to put this down and zoom in, hopefully, so it doesn't go out of frame. Oh, you little bugger. So each blade grip, they're stainless steel, and they've just got this little offset arm and then a pin. And then the pin is sandwiched in between this sliding plate. The plate slides on three little brass sleeves. Nothing appears to be lubricated. Um, I'm probably going to use a, uh, you know, a 70 or 90 weight gear oil in here. It's fairly sticky, high pressure. You know, strictly speaking, I don't know if you'd need to lubricate it, but to me you would. I don't want anything heavy. You know, a nice gear oil I think will work well. Uh, each blade grip uh, goes through a flanged bearing. And then there's, I'm guessing, Delrin. If I was to spec out material for this, it would be Delrin. And each blade grip's got a little sprung C-clip around it, holding it in. But very cool. It's already very smooth, so, you know, maybe you don't have to lubricate it, but uh, you know, lubrication can work both ways, right? It attracts dirt and grime. I think what I'll do is I'll just put a, you know, a few drops of gear oil in there, especially on these sliders, and then after maybe uh, six flights, half a dozen flights, you know, I'll pull the cover off. That's what's nice. It's easy to pull that inspection cover off to have a look. As far as play, there is just the slightest little bit of play. But that's the kind of stuff you want to look at when things are new, and then you can gauge over time how stuff is wearing, if it's wearing. Probably going to lube up this pitch slider push rod too. Where is he? Right there. But that is a Roban Fenestron tail unit. So if you get the 130 or the 135 or the 145, that's it. Lots of parts in here. Actually, have they Loctited everything? The plate was, uh, all the screws for the plate were on with Loctite. Yeah, you can feel there's Loctite in there. Oh, tiny little Allen set screws holding those bushings in, or the bearing. And I think I said in the first video that the blades were, that the tail blades were semi-symmetrical, which is nice on a tail rotor blade, but I don't know if these are or not. Just looking at the profile, does that look semi-symmetrical to you? Kinda does. Yeah, maybe not. Just optical illusion in the lens, I think. So that's the electronics pairing and the Fenestron, what it looks like inside, how it works. Neat system. Thanks for watching, folks. And until next time, happy flights.